Thanks very much, Caroline, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for asking me along to speak today. I'm just going to quickly uh, run through what happened to me a couple of years ago um, and to my late wife, and then also have a quick chat of, as well about what we're hoping to do with the charity um, that we've set up. Yeah, this is where I find out whether I can work the technology. Successful. This um, is Fiona. Um, and Fiona and I were together from 2003 and she was uh, qualified medicine in 1999. Uh, went into hospital medicine initially, spent quite a while um, deciding what she wanted to do. Uh, for a while we thought it was going to be renal, uh, but then it wasn't and she eventually decided she wanted to be a GP. Uh, and so she did her GP registrar year in 2007-2008. Uh, as I said, wife and mum, um, 2010, in this very hospital, this wee lad came along, that's Robert, and my wee boy, and he's uh, just turned four. And we were living settled in Edinburgh at this point. Fiona um, had been locumming as a GP and then ultimately went back to being a GP retainer. And that's her, her training practice there. Uh, and just moving on to 2012, which you'll recognise from one of the golden post boxes from the Olympics, that's Fiona, uh, around about 33 weeks pregnant um, with our second child, and that was taken in August, and it's actually one of the last photographs um, I have of her. What happened um, over the course of several days in late August 2012, um, Sounds like something that's quite extraordinary, but it did all happen, so I'll quickly run through um, the sequence of events. Um, we had recently moved into a new flat in Edinburgh, and as I say, Fee was quite heavily pregnant by this stage. Um, nothing untoward with the pregnancy. Um, she'd had a couple of extra growth scans because, as you'll see from the picture, she was quite petite, <coughs> and this had happened with our first child, Robert. Um, and it all turned out to be fine. Um, she was just very compact because, um, you know, she was quite petite. I should say at this point that I'm not medical um, at all, so forgive me if I if I screw up in any of the terms. But I'll try and explain them as best as I understand them. Um, so everything was kind of progressing as normal. Um, I went to work uh, on Thursday, the 23rd of August. Everything was as normal and. Fiona was having a scan here later on that day, um, just another kind of extra growth scan because again she was quite compact. Um, every single one had shown that there was nothing wrong so we weren't really unduly concerned. Um, round about mid to late morning I started to feel quite unwell at work and it felt for all the world like the beginnings of a cold or flu. Felt kind of a bit sore, a bit snuffly. I kind of thought this is a bit unlucky because it's late August, you don't normally get the flu or something like that in late August. Um, didn't really think anything more of it uh, and just carried on with the normal working routine. Fee was staying at her mum and dad's in Stenhouse Muir. She worked in Bowness and she'd actually been at uh, a course in Forth Valley Hospital on the Tuesday night and she worked Wednesday and Friday so she just decided to stay there um, with Robert uh, just for simplicity over the next few days. So she was actually travelling back in to Edinburgh that day to come up here and it got to about one o'clock and I, by this point, was starting to, to shiver and I thought, good grief, this must be some flu uh, that's taking hold of me quite quickly. Really started to feel quite unwell, um, quite lethargic and just generally that kind of sore feeling that you get when it's not just a, a, a cold or man flu, um, as it's probably better known. Um, the scan was booked for, I think it was quarter to four up here, and I was due to leave the office at three o'clock working in Edinburgh to um, basically travel across here, uh, and Fiona was travelling in. It got to about three o'clock, and by this point, um, I'd gone from feeling really cold to now felt as though I was burning up, and also felt incredibly nauseous. Had a terrible headache, really felt sore, and just felt as though whatever it was was getting a proper grip on me. And to the point where I said, um, I phoned Fiona up and said, I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to go home and lie down because I feel you know, really, really unwell and it's just come on really suddenly. And I felt really bad about it because I'd never missed a scan and I didn't really like the idea of her going to the scan um, by herself, but it, I just did not feel right at all. And 
I don't know whatever it was in what I said or whether she just recognised something, but she was really insistent that I should go to the GP. And of course, being a typical bloke, I just kind of went, oh, no, no, it's just the cold or the flu, I'll be fine. Um, and I was going to go home and I was all set to go home, lie down and go to sleep. And if I had, it probably would have been my last sleep um, because uh, I didn't have the flu. I had um, beginning stages of sepsis, which was actually accelerating pretty rapidly. Um, Fee went to the scan, she had the scan, phoned me again on the way to the scan to make sure that I got home okay, um, insisted that I try and drink some water, which was the last thing I wanted to do at that point. I really just wanted to curl up in a ball and pass out. Um, so I sort of staggered into the house, uh, did just that, but before I did so, I made an appointment with the GP, got an emergency appointment for half five, and Fee then went had the scan. The scan was absolutely fine, um, normal growth, baby was fine. We didn't know with either pregnancy, and we didn't want to know whether we were having a boy or a girl. Um, all we wanted to know was baby was healthy, and we were told everything was fine. So she kind of phoned me on her way back on the speakerphone in the car and said that and that, that she was coming back and she was going to pick me up and take me around to the GP. Asked me how I was. Well, the answer was I was feeling no better. In fact, I just felt as though. For want of a better expression, my body was just unravelling. It really felt like nothing I'd ever experienced before. It happened so quickly and I now absolutely felt out of it. I was starting to feel kind of confused as well as just feeling profoundly unwell. Uh, long story short, Fiona got to me around about five-ish and basically forced me to drink some water, forced me into the car. Now the GP's about five minutes drive, if that, from where we lived uh, in Cumley Bank in Edinburgh. And we got into the car, um, drove round, and I felt so nauseous at that point that before the car even stopped, the water that had gone in came straight back up and I was being sick in the gutter. She got me upstairs into the doctor's surgery. Um, I don't really remember a heck of a lot about that other than the relatively short wait that I had in there was probably the longest wait of my life because I just felt absolutely awful. Um, to the extent that I sat with my head between my knees trying not to be sick the whole time and the only way I can describe it is if I had nothing left even by that point if you told me that my trousers were on fire I would just have shrugged and gone because there was nothing left I just couldn't think straight I couldn't do anything. Um, long story short again uh, they had a confab it was a case of off to A&E I went to the Western the Edinburgh Western um, I was seen very quickly uh, I was given the, the correct treatment, um, was given the, the bundle of treatment, um, intravenous fluids, antibiotics. Um, there was a lot of questions. Uh, I was quite glad that I had a GP with me um, and that she kind of knew my past history. That, that made life a lot easier because I really wasn't in any frame of mind to give sensible answers. But basically, the doctors there um, surmised that I had an infection, um, had some bites in my legs and they'd gotten infected. There was nothing really showing up there yet, but that it had turned into sepsis and actually um, had gone further than that and was probably at the beginning stages of septic shock um, because, as I understand it, and again, forgive me, I'm not medical, even after the treatment the following morning, um, certain key markers like blood pressure were still way low um, and way, way out of kilter with where they should have been. So. That's kind of the short version of, of my story. Got treated, got treated quickly, everything was fine. So by the, this is all happening on the Thursdays. By the Friday morning, as I say, I was told, don't get out of bed um, uh, in a hurry. And I kind of looked and went, why? I still had a temperature at that point. I think my temperature hit 40, um, which wasn't great on the way in. But it was down, it was still high, um, 38 point something. But I felt much, much better. Um, my blood pressure was down something like 80 over 54. And that was it, apparently on its way back up. Um, and I just remember thinking, gosh, that's awfully low. Um, and I was told, don't get out of bed in a hurry because you might faint. And I remember thinking, what on earth is this? What had actually transpired, I had was cellulitis um, in my right leg. And it started to show up on the Friday morning. And it got progressively worse, but it was being treated with antibiotics, but it was, it was still spreading. But the actual sepsis side of things was now more under control. So. For want of a better expression, I am an example of a good outcome, treated promptly, treated with the bundle, and everything went right at every stage that needed to go right. And I, I'm also lucky because uh, I was kind of, I felt as I was yanked back from something that was 
going to be a lot worse very quickly. Um, if Fiona hadn't intervened, uh, I probably would have curled up into a ball and I probably would have gone to sleep. And given the time sensitivity of treating sepsis, I wouldn't have fancied my chances of waking up again, frankly. Um, and the other, the other aspect of it was that um, at the end of it all, physically, uh, I have no after effects. And that's not the case um, for a good many people, perhaps as much as 30% of people who have sepsis or severe sepsis, um, after the fact, they can be left with physical or cognitive difficulties. Um, and that's an area that we need to know more about. By Friday evening, I was feeling, re relatively speaking, a lot better. I had a very red leg that was still spreading, which was slightly concerning, and it was getting quite swollen. But in terms of physically how I felt, it was night and day compared to the way I'd felt the day before. And I'd just gone off to sleep when um, I was woken up by one of the sisters in the ward in the Western, and she said, I've, uh, I've got a call for you. Now, Fee had been in to visit me during the afternoon, and she'd stayed with me late the previous night. And just as she was leaving the afternoon, she said that she felt a bit tired and she had a bit of a shiver as well, which neither of us really thought was out of the ordinary because she used to suffer from Raynaud's syndrome and um, would feel the cold even when nobody else ever felt the cold. I used to actually say to her that I was sure that she wasn't um, mammalian at all. I, th I thought she was a reptile and that was a kind of standing joke. And, and she used to refer to me as the furnace because I, I would always you know, be roasting. So, None of us really thought anything about it, um, but what I got in that call was, um, at that point, the worst call I'd ever taken in my life. It was one of the midwives at Fourth Valley, and Fiona had gone back to her mum and dad's, and basically she came on the phone, and the first thing she said to me was that she had some very bad news, and that the baby had died in utero. Um, Fiona had been admitted suddenly, and the baby had died in utero. And I remember just at that point a total feeling of profound shock. Um, this had come completely out of left field. There was no indication at all about it the previous day. Um, everything had been fine. And my mind, not unnaturally, just started racing all over the place. Um, I was still hooked up to drips and I was not wanting to be there. I was wanting to go and be with Fee. I was concerned to find out who Fiona was. Uh, the initial report of how Fee was was that she was profoundly unwell. Um, she had walked in, but they were trying to make a decision about what to do um, in, in terms of delivering the baby um, to try and really then get her stabilised. Now, what I found out subsequently is that she went home that day, but she only got as far as Grangemouth, and she started to feel very unwell and actually called her dad to come and pick her up. And then she went back to her mum and dad's. Um, again, she thought she was just tired or overdoing it. And it would appear that Again, things just advanced very quickly um, with her and she became very unwell very quickly. She asked for a couple of paracetamol, um, sort of mid-evening time, and for her mum to go in and, and check her after maybe an hour. Now, her mum wasn't very happy about this. She gave it about 10 minutes, went next door to the neighbour who, of theirs who was a midwife, and she took one look at her and said, you have to get her into um, the A&E at the Fourth Valley immediately. So she was taken in there. She walked in um, and was conscious. And as I understand it, they diagnosed that um, she had sepsis uh, within the hour and she started treatment within the hour. And I'll come back to that point in terms of the charity later on. Obviously, I'm lying there having just got this news and my mind's all over the place. I'm worried about my, my head. I'm also bewildered because I don't know what's happened. I don't understand what's happened. And it was a kind of a developing situation. So the midwife was good enough to say that she would call me back once they had some more news. Um, my relatives were having a 40th celebration for my brother in Edinburgh that night, so I actually ended up calling my mum and said, I've got some really bad news, and she came straight over to the hospital. And we weren't really clear about what was going to happen. It was pretty obvious that um, I wasn't meant to be going anywhere because I was only you know, just in there and still hooked up. But we went through that process with the doctors. Um, and they said, you're not fit enough to go anywhere right now. And it was incredibly difficult um, being quite overwrought at that point anyway uh, and being still ill um, to actually listen to that. But I kind of remember thinking, well, if he was here, she's a doctor, what would she tell me to do? She'd tell me to listen to the doctors um, who were looking after me. So, you know, against every, everything and every instinct, I kind of listened and I stayed there.
And I mean, they were very, very good about it, but they were quite clear about it at that point. We then got a further update to say that um, she really wasn't very well at all, um, that they were still trying to work out what was going to happen with the baby. Um, and you know, basically, she was being assessed, but deteriorating. Um, and this was maybe pushing midnight by this point. And then there was going to be a third call to give me a further update in terms of once the people, the team had decided what they were going to do, um, and what action they were going to take. And that call never came. What happened next was that about one in the morning, I think, um, again, the sister came through and said, right, you've got to get your clothes on and you're going to have to go through to Fourth Valley. Um, so obviously this was a complete U-turn from what had been said but an hour previously. And I knew at that point that the situation must be very grave because that wouldn't be done lightly. Um, we got through to Fourth Valley. We arrived about, I guess, three in the morning. By that point, um, Fee was unconscious and uh, we were met with the team who were looking after her. And her condition at that point was described as critical and unstable. And again, not being medical, um, I don't know exactly what that means medically, but I know enough to know that that's really quite grave. And that was the situation. And it was just bewildering to go and to go through and see her. Um, at this point, I couldn't walk, so I was still in a wheelchair. And to go through and sit next to her. And I spoke to her and talked to her. Um, and she was already deeply unconscious by that point. Um, the team were very good. They, the doctors were very good and they explained what they were going to try and do, which was to deliver the baby naturally, um, and then really just try and get Fiona stabilised. But the key thing was that, first of all, they had to deliver the baby. And uh, I mean, at that point, you know, you're, you're trying to process an awful lot of information. So um, even at that stage, though, you think, well, try and, you know, try and save Fiona. Um, there's, n you know, there's nothing more we can do for the baby but try and save Fee. Um, so we went into a patient waiting room and what happened uh, over the next couple of hours was they, they obviously did the, the birth and it was a stillbirth and it was around about six o'clock in the morning um, that the midwives came through and they were very good and um, they brought through um, the baby and she didn't have a mark on her. Um, it was a wee girl and that was the first that we knew we were having a wee girl. And she had the same wee button nose that her brother had. Um, she was five pounds, three ounces. And there was nothing wrong with her other than she'd been killed by sepsis. Um, her mum had contracted sepsis. And that was, if you like, the first part of her system um, to shut down. So it was left to me alone uh, to name her. And she was called Isla. And then she was called Elspeth Elizabeth after her two grandmothers. And that was my wee girl. And at that point, um, I really didn't think that, that life could get any worse at that point. Um, it was just the most awful point in my life at, at that stage. And utterly bewildering and utterly shocking. Um, as the day went on, Unfortunately, things did not get better. Um, Fiona remained critical and unstable and was continuing to, to bleed after the birth. Um, and I was kind of going up and down to E&E &E during the day to carry on with um, treatment whilst Fourth Valley tried to get me a bed. And in between times, was going and spending as much time as I could with Fiona, who, as I said, was now deeply unconscious, um, but I kept talking to her. Um, kept trying to encourage her, um, telling her to fight, you know, told her we loved her, everybody was needing her, all the things that you would normally expect somebody to say, and really just trying to encourage her however she could. Not sure whether she could hear me or not, but from everything I understood, people who are unconscious can sometimes take things in, that seems to be the consensus. Um, so I just kept talking to her. Um, they tried a couple of procedures during the day, and they didn't quite work. Um, what was really happening was every time that she would get a blood transfusion, she would temporarily stabilise and then as it wore off, um, she just became unstable again. And that was really the pattern throughout the day. And by this point, um, I mean, from very early on, she'd been on a ventilator, but by this point she was on 
uh, a dialysis machine and frankly it looked to me as though every other machine there was under the sun. What I found out subsequently was that if she'd been a rare blood type they would have run out of blood in the hospital for her. Um, such was the level of, of transfusion that she was getting. This pattern carried on through the day uh, until about late afternoon and I spoke with the consultant at that point and said um, what, you know, how long can you keep this going for? And he actually said that we can keep it going for quite a long time, but the key thing was that they had to try and get her stable. And by this point, none of the family had slept for ages. And I remember about nine o'clock, we tried to grab about 10 minutes sleep, and I don't think we'd even had more than a few minutes when we actually were told to come through at nine o'clock on the, the Saturday evening because she was incredibly unstable by this point. And I think there was concern that they might lose her at that point. Um, now, you know, amazingly, the, the team did fantastic work on her, and I, I can't commend them highly enough because they worked on her all day, and there just seemed to be a squad of them around her um, at all times. And they got her stabilised again, but the same issue was still um, a problem. She would not stop bleeding, and they could not get her stabilised. Um, and by this point, you know, there was a concern that. At one point, they just wouldn't be able to sort of keep her stable. <coughs> the same pattern, blood transfusions going in, but then just as they wore off, as she bled them out, then she would just go unstable again. Um, so they brought her back to a stable position this time, around about 10 o'clock, and what they said was, right, we have to try another procedure. And so they took a long time making her ready, trying to get her as stable as possible, to take her down to theatre. Um, this is about midnight, and I spoke with her um, for quite a while before she went down to theatre and then when she was taken down to theatre I was then taken down to a &E for a last round of antibiotics for that day and I came back up um, I, I guess it would be about 2.20 in the morning and I'd been back in the room for just a few minutes and there was a knock on the door and I saw most of the team outside and at that point I knew um, that the worst had happened and what had happened was that she had arrested on the operating theatre table at 1.50am and they hadn't been able to bring her back. And that was how over the course of literally 62 hours um, I nearly lost my life, I lost my daughter and I lost my wife um, to sepsis. And at this point um, Having, with everything having happened, um, it's fair to say that I was in a place that, believe me, that none of you ever, ever want to visit. Um, it was beyond bewilderment. It was just pure, utter, unadulterated shock and horror, actually, as well. And I wanted to try and understand what had happened. So um, I wanted to understand what this was. I'd never heard of sepsis. Um, I'd vaguely heard of blood poisoning, I'd vaguely heard of uh, septicemia. Um, what I've basically found out over the course of that weekend, that was the beginning of education, was that there are at least 37,000 deaths per annum from sepsis in the UK. On the Sunday afternoon after she passed away, I spoke with one of the consultants there, um, a chap called Chris Cairns, who's, um, who specialises in sepsis amongst other things. And he was very good at just explaining all about it and began to give me some of the, an insight um, into the, just the numbers of people who were affected by it just going through Fourth Valley. And when I heard these numbers, um, people that were cheating every year with sepsis, I, I didn't actually believe them at first because I kind of scaled them up and I thought, well, that, that cannot be right. It's like thousands, tens of thousands. And this is something I've never heard of and nobody really seems to be aware of. You know, and I just started asking lots of questions. Um, and. Chris was very good. He, if you like, began the process um, that ultimately led to the charity because when I heard about it, I just thought, this is insane. You have this thing that's, that's affecting tens of thousands of people and killing tens of thousands of people, and in terms of profile, it is nowhere. I mean, it is absolutely nowhere compared to AIDS or any of the cancers you want to pick or any of the other things um, like leukaemia that just get tons more press coverage. So. Um, I'm a lawyer by background and I went on, uh, being a lawyer, I went and checked um, Scottish Charities uh, website, uh, the regulator's website and found there was no sepsis charity in Scotland. So what we did next was we established um, the Fiona Elizabeth Agnew Trust on May Day 
uh, last year. And we sought charitable status with Oscar, um, the regulatory body, and we got it on the 22nd of May, 2013. And those are our two hashtags. Um, what I said to people at Fiona's Memorial was I wanted everybody to spread the word about feet and I want everybody to do a feat for feet. Um, they don't all have to be running, jumping, swimming uh, or whatever. A physical feats, but Fee was very outdoorsy. She liked being out in the fresh air. She loved climbing hills. So I thought it was a good way to try and get people to do something, to do something positive, to raise awareness, to raise funds, um, and at the same time, hopefully get a bit healthier as well. And our hashtag is also, if you like, our slogan, um, which is to stop sepsis now, because there are things that we can do right now, and I know a lot of you will know this, um, so forgive me if I'm preaching to the choir, but there are things we can do right now to actually stop sepsis. What we're trying to do as a charity, um, first of all, is to raise awareness. Without raising awareness, we can do nothing, and we're very, very limited if people aren't, first of all, being told about the condition, secondly, understanding what it is, and thirdly, knowing what to do about it. As I said, there was a general lack of information um, on a general level in the media, so we set about changing that, and that's the launch. Uh, we got a lot of publicity for that, um, and then five of us set off along the West Highland Way in the heat wave last year, which if you're ever thinking of doing the West Highland Way, I'd recommend that you don't pick the high summer in a heat wave. <laughs> what are aims and objectives? Well, it took us a little while to work this out. Um, it's really twofold. Initially, the short term is awareness. Without awareness, we do nothing. It's, there's a, a vicious circle. If you don't tell people what's wrong with them, then they're not going to want to do anything to stop it happening to somebody else. And if they don't know what's wrong with them, if they don't understand it, then they're just going to do nothing. So if you say to somebody, we've well, had an infection, then they'll think, oh, that's just one of these things and it's treated with antibiotics and that's it. Whereas if you actually explain to them, actually, you've had sepsis or septic shock, they'll maybe realise, actually, that's something different and there's something else we need to do about it. So the flip side of the vicious circle is the virtuous circle where you tell more people and you raise a big flag and you say to people, this is what sepsis is, and people start coming to you and going, right, I got that, and I had that, and they want to do things about it because it nearly killed them, or it killed somebody they loved, or because they've still got problems after having it, or just because they were profoundly unwell. And that's really what we're trying to do, because, to my mind, if we've got 100,000 people out there every year plus, and those are probably an underestimate, unfortunately, um, who are suffering from this, then that's a huge army of people who are untapped and who could actually be mobilised to do something about this and to raise money and to raise awareness. And that's how we'll spread and that's how we'll do it, um, to try and get things done as quickly as possible. It does put me in mind an awful lot of perhaps where we were with cancer 40, 50 years ago, where it was hard, it was difficult, people didn't understand as much about it as they do now. Doctors didn't talk about it. You didn't get told you were going to die. You told you maybe you maybe had a mass or there was a shadow in the lung. It was all very cloak and daggery or we weren't comfortable talking about it. The only way we dealt with that was by bringing it out into the sunlight, focusing on it, explaining it to people, and then you've now got a proliferation of cancer charities for all the different cancers. I think at the last count there was something like 620 cancer charities covering different aspects of the disease in the UK. In the UK at the moment, we have two sepsis charities. It's not enough. We need a lot more. I mean, you're concerned with maternal sepsis. There's paediatric sepsis, geriatric sepsis, sepsis aftercare, sepsis education, general sepsis. There are all these different strands. And one of the things we've learned very quickly as a charity is that you can really only do one thing and you have to do it well, because if you come out with too many different messages, it causes confusion. So our objective initially is to come up with one message, which is just to raise awareness. Our objective longer term is sepsis research. From what we know right now, we could save probably between 10 and 12,500 of the 37,000 that are all estimates, but those are the numbers that we're working on at the moment, if people were just treated timelessly and in the right way. We're wanting to go after some of the harder cases in the mid to long term. People like Fee, who, yes, she was um, immunocompromised because she was pregnant, but that's not enough to explain what happened to her when she was treated quickly and with the right, um, the right treatment. Diagnosed and treated within the hour and it made not a blind bit of difference and that 
is quite scary and quite dangerous and needs to be looked at. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I think it's in a long haul. But we do need to understand why some people respond to treatment, some people don't. There's one study that's come out that suggests that people who burn up quickly um, at the beginning and get a high temperature have generally better outcomes than people who don't. Now, that could be because the temperature burns off the bugs. I don't know. I'm not medical. But at least it's, there's things, little snippets like that, that just haven't been followed up that we'd like to understand more about. Um, because, frankly, you know, we know what will save the people who can be saved right now, and we need to know what will save the more difficult cases, particularly um, because on the basis of the most recent evidence, and it's not just better coding that's doing this, but the background mm -hmm. level of cases appears to be rising. So this is something that we need to get a handle on because it doesn't look like it's going to go away quickly or easily. So what are we doing about it? Well, these are people doing lots of positive good things. Um, this is Amy. Amy's a doctor. She was the first person to ever do a Feet for Feet, and she ran the Edinburgh Marathon for us last year. Um, this is Joel. Now, I'm not being unkind. Joel's one of my friends, but he wouldn't describe himself as a true athlete. Um, <laughs> but he ran two 5Ks, and he also helped set a world record in the second 5K because it was the greatest number of runners in kilts ever <laughs> in Perth last year. So he was quite pleased with that. Um, these guys in the bottom right, well, that's them earlier on. That's them uh, on the last leg of doing the West Highland Way, and they decided that uh, they weren't going to do it over five days or even four days. They decided they were going to try and do it in under 48 hours, and they managed it in 45 hours and 50 minutes. Um, that's them the following morning. The, the pictures, I've, I've spared you from the pictures of them at the end of it because they were broken at the end of it. Uh, but that's them in the final leg, and it was at least quite kind weather for them. And we've had people doing swimming and triathlons and running, and we've got off to a really good start with that. Um, this is 2014 so far, and the good thing is there are more people doing the feats and they are spreading. Um, this young lad here, that was our first Australian feat. Um, he's uh, a young lad called Patrick Wilson, and he was 10, and he swam in the sea in Australia. Um, I think it was something like 800 metres, which frankly is, is far enough um, because uh, they have scary, bitey things in the, in the <laughs> sea there. Um, and he did very well, and so that was our first Antipodean feat. Um, these ladies ran the, the recent Glasgow 10K. We had two people in the Edinburgh Marathon this year, so hopefully we can carry on with that kind of rate of growth. And this is Marianne, and she ran it this year. Um, this uh, beardy chap here is a chap called Tom, and you'll probably see from the, the badge, um, he ran in the London Marathon, and he was a first runner in the London Marathon, and uh, did quite well for himself uh, as well, and, and raised awareness and, and funds to the charity. And we had a total of 18 people in Brighton who uh, ran as a team in the Brighton Half Marathon, and again, they all did very well, uh, emblazoned in their new uh, specially designed running tops which I was told we had to get made because t-shirts weren't acceptable for marathons and half marathons. So we thought that was reasonable. If they're going to run that far for us, we should get in the proper kit. And that's really what we're trying to do. And in terms of the feats, we're trying to get people, people often will run for whatever cause, but um, we've kind of gone through, obviously there's a circle of friends and then family, friends of friends. And what we're now doing, and what we're now beginning to break into our, if you like, the fourth circle, people we don't know. You know, none of us connected with it know, and that's what we have to do. We have to mobilise the general public. There's an awful lot of people out there who will want to do stuff. They need to know what was wrong with them. They need to understand that. And so, again, back to this virtuous circle, the more we can explain, the more people will go, ah, right, that's that thing that happened to, and they understand and they want to do something about it. And then you can actually get real traction for change, because without money, we can't really change very much. With money, there's a lot we can do. We've also um, been all over the media. Um, initially, we got quite a lot of press at the start. We've uh, also had subsequent press in the likes of Women's Own and the Daily Mail. Um, what we're finding is that it's mainly women who are spreading the word. Um, I think, in part, that's because women are generally better at health things. Um, and I'm outnumbered here, so I would say that anyway. <laughs> um, but also because I think it's maternal sepsis as well, and it strikes a chord with, um, with women, and they're very, very good at actually spreading the word and then telling their men folk what to do and to get up off their backsides and go and do feats. So that's all working out quite well. Um, 
What we're trying to do at the moment, initially obviously the media are very interested in the personal story and you do a trade-off with the media um, and basically what we've done so far and what I've done um, is I've spoken to them in that context but also mentioning about the trust. As the trust now begins to gain its feet and do things in its own right, hopefully the focus we can then put on to other people and obviously what we're doing rather than why we've been set up. Um, and that's really the next stage, if you like, in the, in the narrative. The other aspect um, to raise awareness, I think we're averaging maybe a talk probably every three, four weeks to various hospitals, um, whether it's pr and, or primary care, secondary care organisations, probably since about last summer, since we were first set up. Um, and it's either myself or one of the other trustees will just go and speak. We've all in our own different ways got um, different experiences of sepsis and um, have been impacted in different ways. Everybody knew on the board knew Fiona, but they've also got other experiences as well of sepsis. And we've got three doctors on the, the board as well who've obviously got professional interest in it too. Um, our first seminar that we did for World Sepsis Day, um, we pulled together. That's Kevin Rooney speaking, uh, just giving an update on what the latest findings are with sepsis at that point. Um, it is available on YouTube. It's uncut, um, so it's about an hour and a half. Kevin's bit is the first bit, though, and then there's a, a beardy bloke wittering on after that. So if you want, if you're going to watch anything, it's worthwhile watching Kevin's um, slot because he really um, is at the, the very centre of everything we're trying to do in Scotland in terms of gaining better data and actually driving improvement. And this is probably the next thing. Um, we recently held our first uh, ball, um, which according to some of the trustees might be our last ball, uh, <laughs> because it was, uh, it was quite something to, to get it organised. Um, what we want to do now, and I think this is a longer term campaign, we want people to keep doing feats, but we also want a visible symbol of what sepsis is, in the same way that you've got all the different lapel badges um, for various different charities. Um, you've got the AIDS badges, you've got the pink ones, they're all different colours and things associated with different um, conditions. Uh, you've got bracelets as well, and they've all been kind of done and done well, and there's not much space left in that. So we kind of thought, right, well, what does everybody wear? Everybody wears socks and tights. And, and then I would, I'd like to say it was a proper brainstorming exercise, but it wasn't really. It was just us sitting around. But we thought, well, red and white, they're quite distinctive. They're also quite medical. Um, they are obviously the colours of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent. But they're originally the colours of the barber's pole, which was, of course, originally the surgeon barber's pole. So they're very visible, distinctive, and let's be honest, if you see people wearing these things, you're going you're gonna to wonder what on earth they're on um, and why they're doing it. So we encouraged everybody to um, don stripes and socket to sepsis, and that's what we're going to try and work on in their up to World Sepsis Day and beyond, because then if people are wearing a visible symbol and they're doing things like having a coffee morning or having cups of tea or cupcake stand or whatever, in hospitals, it's a very high vis symbol, and hopefully, our hope is that in time people will recognise that in the same way that they recognise other things to do with other conditions. Um, basically, we will, we will try whatever we can to get it in, more into public consciousness because then again we can go back to the more awareness we have, the more we can do. And there's no plan for it um, that has been handed down from lots of. Um, other charities other than, because I've spoken to quite a few of them and said we, we feel as though we're pulling at levers and pushing buttons to try and figure out what works and they, they turn around, every single one of them went, yeah that's what we do as well. Now I think you can get a feel for certain things working and certain things not working so we're still at the stage where we're um, able to do these things and we're quite nimble and quite flexible so we're going to try the things and figure out what works. We hope this takes off, um, certainly everybody striped up and um, including, rather unfortunately, some of the gentlemen who were wearing kilts decided that tights were a better option. Now, I don't even want to think about what was going on in their heads, but um, I'm assured there are no photographs. So, um, But we got some good publicity from that again. The Scotsman um, partnered up with us from a media point of view, and we were also partnered up with Morrison's LLP, the law firm, um, and we're their chosen charity for this year. So. Again, it's just gradually getting corporate interest and spreading the word that way as well. So far, um, in year one, we're over £50,000. Um, and we've done quite a lot as well as traditional media, also on social media. 
Um, there's a really, really interesting thing though, and I know everybody's in love with Twitter and thinks it's fantastic, but we've done a lot of Google Analytics on our website and just giving traffic, and 97% of it comes from there. 3% oops, comes from Twitter. Um, and we were really surprised, but again, it's borne out by the, the, the numbers and the stats. And Facebook is, we think, kind of preferable anyway because it's more semi-permanent, whereas Twitter can very often be just a stream of noise. And it's great if something's happening at the time, in real time, but then it's a bit like snow in the river, it's gone. And you can search back for it and everything like that, whereas Facebook people just tend to spend a bit more time on. So. Both of those have led to quite a lot of awareness as well and spreading the word. And every time somebody does a feat, we think you know, they're, they're raising awareness. People might not have heard of sepsis. So we're hopeful that it won't necessarily be two million people, but we hope that a proportion of those people have maybe never heard of the condition before and are now more aware of it. Those are the key aims, awareness, awareness, awareness. Um, I did some basic research and Again, I'm not medical, but if I can do this, then it, I don't understand why it's not been uh, more widely um, acknowledged. Liver disease is quoted as the UK's fifth biggest killer and it kills about 16,000 people a year and that's from um, the published stats in 2010. So again, using simple arithmetic, it's not. It's sepsis and it's probably at least the fifth biggest killer. I wouldn't be surprised if it's the fourth or the third. Um, and the key point is awareness remains far too low. I think if we weren't to go out into the street and on the most recent numbers we've got, I think in the UK, um, you're talking about in the low teens in terms of recognition. More people will recognise blood poisoning, more people will recognise sep septicemia, um, but the term sepsis is still not that well known. Now, it is beginning to change, and the more we do, hopefully, the more we can change that, but it will take time. So, what's next for the Trust? Um, we will do more fundraising. We have more feats in the pipeline. Longer term, as I've said, we're going to socket to sepsis, and... Um, we haven't quite thought exactly where that's going to go, but if it works, if people like it, we may get to the stage where we vary the stripe pattern year on year like they do with comic relief. So you might end up one year with vertical stripes or I don't know, diagonal stripes. Um, but we'll try and kind of, we, we just hope that that will take off as a visible symbol, a recognisable symbol. Um, in the planning stages, we've got a short film, um, almost a calling card, so we're, we can't go, the film can go. Um, a more widespread awareness campaign involving patient stories. We do want to stress to people that there are positive outcomes um, as well with sepsis and it is down to timing. The longer you delay treatment and or, and or getting to hospital, if you've got the, the symptoms, then potentially the more serious the outcome and the stats bear that out. Um, equally, we understand that we do not want to create an avalanche of the worried well, so flooding GPs, surgeries and a and &E. Uh, none of you will thank, and none of your colleagues will thank us for that. So it's a balanced message. And then this is all leading up to World Sepsis Day um, 2014 in September, where again, you know, we, we'll hopefully have a lot of focus on the condition that day and um, on previous form. If we can, we should be doing a, some sort of seminar or some sort of event. Um, we've got a planning call next month with Healthcare Improvement Scotland to figure out what we can do. So maybe a kind of formal event like a seminar. Um, but we also, I think, will try and get as many hospitals involved uh, as possible wearing stripy socks and doing silly things because at the end of it, if people are having fun whilst they're raising money, then that's what it's all about as well. Um, very embryonic at this stage to try and encourage research. Um, we're looking into how we could fund grants and or a prize <coughs> excuse me, in areas that might be of interest um, in terms of the more difficult cases. Now, as I say, initially our focus will still be on awareness. We have to build a proper war chest before we can do anything meaningful on that bottom um, line, but we will start doing it as soon as we can. That's all the contact details. The hashtag for Twitter is Stop Sepsis Now, and it's also now a hashtag on Facebook. Um, anybody's feeling generous, that's where you go to, and if you're going to do a feat, that's where you go to as well. There's information on the website. The website is um, still quite thin in terms of uh, content updates, mainly because, like all websites, it's quite a swine to update it. Um, and we, fight, we tend to kind of post more up-to-date information on the, the Facebook page, um, but we will be revamping the website and trying to make it more of a resource both for the medical community as well as for um, lay people as well. Twitter, it's at Stop Sepsis Now. 
and emails info at feetuk.org.uk. We've got two web domains without wanting to confuse you too much, but the one that we generally stick with is stopsepsis.org.uk. Um, and that's, that, that's the one that most of the traffic goes into. And at the end of it all, um, I no longer live in Edinburgh and uh, I tend not to be down here quite as much as I used to be, but I can tell you when I leave here today, I'll be going to lay flowers at the Dean Park Cemetery and that's where Fiona and Isla are buried. And at the end of it all, we will keep doing this for as long as I draw breath and for as long as all my trustees draw breath because I do not want anybody else and none of my trustees and none of our friends and none of our family want anybody else to go through what we've all been through. It needs to stop. It needs to be stopped immediately and as quickly as we can because in the background the numbers are increasing. So we will keep going, we will keep doing whatever we can. We think there are quick wins that can be had right now and there's lots of great work that you and all your other teams will be doing to help reach that goal. We want to get after the more difficult cases, the cases like Fiona, um, and hopefully in the long term we'll actually solve some of those as well. We have to start somewhere and we've begun. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.